Yes, hello, 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 hello out there in Blog Talk Radio land. Hello, my darlings. It is another glorious Wednesday. And you know what time it is, darlings. I hope you have all of your comforts together because, babies, it is time to dish tea. And you're dishing tea, darlings. Ha <laughs> ha! With Big Me Tay, hey, what's going on? Child, that song just stirs me. I just love that song for the opening. And y'all have to just give me a moment because already it has already sent me there. <laughs> and y'all know it don't take much for me to do, but that song just sent me right there, honey. Oh, my God. But it is, it is, it's going to be okay. And I'm fine. And I hope you are, too. Thank you for joining us today, honey. It is going to be just absolutely fantastic. Uh, today's show is going to be an eye opener. When I tell y'all we got some tea today, a nice big old huge hot pot. I hope you brought your crumpet sugar because, baby, we are about to get down into some real serious LGBT culture. So uh, tell all your friends, honey, if you're listening by computer or by phone, and you wish to join in on the conversation, please feel free to call in at 347-205-9183. That's 347-205-9183. The tea room is open, so if you're on computer and wish to, to conversate over there, you're more than welcome. Hello, Road to Stardom Radio. I see you over there in the tea room. Thank you for joining us. Um, so you could go right over there. And let me put my disclaimer about the, the tea room, honey. Please remember. That over there in the chat room, the tea room, honey, it is a written conversation. I, you know, we're in this whole new thing now where everything is texting and this, that, and the third. So we end up basing our responses on our experiences. So you may think somebody trying to neck roll, you're trying to read, you're trying to let you have it. And it may be your perception of what they wrote. So just be mindful, honey. When you're over there, please dish your tea responsibly. You know, it's okay to disagree, just don't be disagreeable. Because if I come in there, honey, and see that y'all trying to tear up my shit, honey, I'm going to cut to the white meat, and I mean that seriously, okay? So just dish your tea over there responsibly. If you have any questions, comments, and or concerns, you wish to become a sponsor, you want to be a guest on the show, you have uh, new show ideas or topics or whatever, please feel free to either email me at bigmeach at dishingtea.com. That's bigmeach, B-I-G-M-E-A-C-H, at dishingtea.com. Or you could just simply go to the website at www.dishingtea.com. That's www.dishing, D-I-S-H-I-N-G, T-T-E-A, like the drink, dot com. And over there you will find, you know, information about Dishing Tea. You will uh, have all of the links to all of the social network pages, the Twitter page. Yes, honey, please, I got to start getting my, tweet, my tweets up or whatever. I only have 447 followers on Twitter, honey. I need, Everybody got 16,000. They got millions of followers. Child, please, I have nothing. So go over there, honey. I'm Big Meach One or at Big Meach One on on Twitter, on the Twitter sphere or whatever. So y'all go over there and follow me there. You can uh, also uh, like the Facebook pages as well, and also on the on the uh, website you will have a link so that you can get the latest copy of my book, Awakenings: Epiphanies Along a Spiritual Journey. Uh, yeah, that's available for you at the website. So please feel free to go right over there. You also have information about my play that I'm producing. I had to push it back. I know. Y'all know I was hospitalized and everything, so we had to push everything back, and I got to get a new date. But we're still looking for sponsors and things. So all of that information is over there at the website, and that's www.dishingtea.com. The name of the play is called No Time for the Pain. It is an LGBT play, so it gives you all of the information. Honey, this is complete drama. Drama, 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 honey. Uh, yes, I call it a dramedy. So, you know, we got some laughs in there, but we really have um, a wonderful, wonderful uh, show for you. In fact, the, the log line of the show is fraternal twins Danielle and Eric confront one another on the issues of HIV, infidelity, and um I just tore all that up. I, I'm sorry. I stuttered because I just tore all of that up. Anyway, just go to the website, honey, because I'm, I'm excited about what's coming up. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm over here in the tea room. Hello there, guest 1374. Uh, when you're over in the tea room, if you wish to conversate, you're going to have to uh, create a profile page so that you can get your screen name up, and that's how you're able to interact with everybody in the tea room. If you're just in as a guest, it won't let you uh, communicate, but you can read everything that's going on, okay? So that there is that. I think I have everything. No, I have a special announcement. Let me say this here because uh, we have some information for you. One of my sponsors, Feral's Treasure Box in Detroit, Michigan, is putting together a Detroit Shop Nibble and Network Old School Bazaar. This is coming up in a few weeks on Saturday, May 4th and May 5th, but it is running all, every weekend in May. And right now, my darlings, for those of you who are vendors or you are, uh, you're entrepreneurs and carrying on and you, you have product that you would like to come on out, you want to set up a table, I am telling you this is the best deal in the house because – they are going to let you come down every weekend for our th- throughout the entire month of May. So you have uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, okay, to come on out and to – no, I'm sorry. I think it's just Saturday and Sunday. Uh, yeah, it's Saturday and Sunday, March, uh, May 4th and 5th, May 11th and 12th, May 18th and 19th, the 25th and the 26th. Okay, so it's just a Saturday and a Sunday. Covering all of those days, you would pay a one-time fee for your table of $35 for all dates, all eight days. $35 covers all eight days versus paying $35 each day. That there is the T for anybody who is looking, child, please, it pays for itself. So if you are a vendor and you're in the Detroit area want to know more information about the Detroit Shop Nibble and Network Old School Bazaar, I need you to contact Mr. Harvey at 313-713-2860. That's 313-713-2860. That there is a special announcement, honey. Uh, they say tables and chairs will be provided. The fee covers four weekends in the month of July, so it's a one-time fee of $35 for all eight days. Now, that you cannot beat. Again, please call Mr. Harvey at 313-713-2860 for more information on how you can become a sponsor. Now, they limit it only to 20, so, honey, you have to get up in there because they do have uh, spaces available, but they're running out, so you need to jump on that very, very quickly. So that there is my special announcement uh, for right now. Um, Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry I done got distracted again. I, I got, I'm a one-person show, honey, so I'm doing 15 things at the same time. And as I get excited, y'all know how I get. So let me regroup here. I'm going to need something, some form of libation because my my palate is parched. And when we come back from this particular uh, commercial break, we're going to go right into the show. Today's show I call, I've Got One Question, How Do I Look, Darling? Ah, Okay. That there's the name of the show, and when we get off into this, we're going to be talking with my guest, Mr. Wolfgang Bush, who is the director of the groundbreaking documentary, which has been considered to be the sequel to Paris is Burning, called How Do I Look? I'll get more into that in just a few moments, but right now, let me let my sponsors do a little bit of the talking, because I'm talking, I'm, y'all know how I get, so I'll talk to you in just a few seconds. The Big Brothers Network. Yeah, men of color, men of size. The Big Brothers Network was created to celebrate the larger man of color and those who admire him. We intend to promote a positive self-image within our community and the mainstream population. Our goal is to embrace our differences, to inspire self-love, and increase camaraderie through positive, brotherly interactions. We intend to accomplish these goals through the BBN magazine, local and national events, and networking forums. For more information or to catch the latest copy of the BBN magazine, please go to www.bigbrothersnetwork.com. That's www.bigbrothersbrothasnetwork.com. The Big Brothers Network, men of color, men of size.
Trig Laboratories manufactures premium sexual wellness and consumer health care products and is the parent company of Wet International Incorporated, one of the world's best-selling lines of personal lubricants and intimacy products. We carry a large variety of personal and flavored lubricants, flavored heating massage lotions, and aromatherapy heating massage oils. Whether you need a little or a lot, WET has you covered. Our line of high-quality, innovative, and unique products are formulated using only the finest ingredients at our FDA-approved facility, meeting the strictest manufacturing standards. WET is available worldwide at specialty stores and online retailers and at pharmacies nationwide. For more information or to find a retailer near you, log on to www.stayswetlonger.com. Trig Laboratories. We create fun, quality, trusted products to innovate your intimacy. Ferrostreasurebox.com, a quality online Detroit mobile business. Custom, affordable, high-quality, handcrafted art, jewelry, gifts, and accents for you, your event, home, office, or business. Contact Peter Jackson, Artistic Director, at 248-688-5178. 248-688-5178. Ferrostreasurebox.com, embracing a fusion of cultures and making art beautifully affordable. Sexy, you're sexy, sexy, sex virus, sexy, you're sexy, sexy, you're sex virus. I wanna get so beer up in here. Hey, hey, I wanna get so beer up in here. I wanna pump it up, put up, pump. I wanna pump it up, put up, pump. I wanna get so beer up in here. How do I look? Mysterious. Feminine, fem, 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 feminine, fem, 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 feminine. That's the 
way you get your ten. I'm walking, I'm serving. So tell me, how do I look? I'm walking, I'm serving. So tell me, how do I look? Bizarre. Futuristic depends on how you fix it. It's so neo matrix, and no one can't mistake it. Fashion statements blowing your mind, giving you looks that's one of a kind. The final category is realness. All forms of realness. Femme queen. Butch queen. Drag. School boy. Pretty boy. And realness, realness, realness with a twist. These are the boys that can bend their wrists. Watch them serve it, do it like this, like this, 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 this. Realness, realness, realness with a twist. These are the boys that can bend their wrists. Watch them serve it, do it like this, like this, 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 this. Today, we are going to be completely fierce as we get ready to work the runway, honey, and give face. Today's show, we'll be taking a look into the infamous ball scene culture of New York City. Now, how many of y'all remember Paris is burning? You know, touch this skin, touch all this skin, darling. Or how about O P U L E N C E, opulence? <laughs> I love all that. Well, darlings, today we are. Uh, we were asked just this one question that everybody always wants to know, honey. How do I look? Okay, this "How Do I Look" is a new documentary. Well, it's been out for a little minute, but many of you may not have known that it was out. Um, it's a new documentary that has been considered to be a sequel to Paris Is Burning, and it takes us even further into the world of the of the ballroom, and it has taken us into explaining some things, and it took us a step further than what Paris is Burning has done. Director Wolfgang Bush will be here, dishing the tea on how this film came to be, the importance to the education of the LGBT, of LGBT culture and its relevance to preserving the legacies of those who have made it possible for many of us to get our lives on the floor, honey. So I hope you have all of your crumpets, darling, and we taking it to the floor because we are about to rip the one way and not get chopped with all this delicious hot pot of tea. And it's all tea, no shade, honey. Welcome to the show. This is the one and only. He is Wolfgang Bush. Hello there, my darling. How art thou? I am just sitting here sipping on my delicious tea. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Honey. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you for accepting because I remember when you were putting this together, you were looking for sponsorship and carrying on, honey. I think I may have sent maybe 5 or $10, and I said, honey, I need to see what this is going to be about, you know. And then as I said, a lot of folks have come to believe that this was going to be, a, you know, a sequel to Paris is Burning. However, after reading your bio <clears> – <throat> And some things that you have you have voiced publicly, we are going to go into the whole understanding of why how do I look was important, why did it touch your heart, you know your relevance in the ballroom sure. circuit, and exactly the you know what all of this means. So before okay. we get into the meat, 
let's go here and give the audience uh, a little bit of your background and, you know, talk about a little bit of your advocacy and your 25 years of being a, a, a staple of LGBT culture. Uh, before I do that, I would like to give credit to the song you were just playing, Credit Where Credit uh -huh. Is Due, because this great uh, title track was written and produced by DJ Jib Jab Ninja, and, uh, and the commentator on the track is uh, Evi, uh, um, Dijon Ivisu, and also Miranda Thompson did some voice uh, on the track, and so did Charles Gilmore. So. They all volunteered their time to the cause, and uh, we always uh, have to appreciate uh, people who make positive contributions to a movement. So in regards of my background, I came to New York in about 84, and uh, I started working at the Musicians' Union and was first time introduced to... Uh, what discrimination was and and all that, which I really didn't have any experience. So I was like picketing at the uh, outside uh, tracks, which was then a rock and roll space because they right. would make bands pay to play. So that's kind of where I got my activism juices going. And then like in 87, I saw my uh, first ball at tracks uh, at the disco, where uh, Extravas had their for had a ball, and I was uh, exposed to the feathers and beads by Dorian Corey and and Avis Pendavis and Pepper. So I've seen seen still the glory days of uh, of uh, ballroom and Danny and uh, Hector Extrava still alive during the voguing, mm -hmm. and uh, I was also experiencing if you got chopped. Back in the days, you know, mm. you weren't just walking away bitching and screaming and mourning and groaning. You actually, uh, you know, these bitches went back to the judge and tried to convince him to give me that 10. You right. know, in a in an artistic way and prove that you had what it took to get a, a 10 across the board. And today, you know, I don't see that anymore. So that is a big change, unfortunately, that I've seen in the in the in the scene also and because I was a club promoter in New York City for, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I was a, stra a gay guy doing straight parties and I was involved in sports so I did a fundraiser for the gay games which is like the gay Olympics I was mm -hmm. part of bowling mm -hmm. and I did a fundraiser at the Palladium for them and I invited my gay promote our friends to raise funds for the gay games and that's how I was introduced to James Saunders a gay black promoter in New York also the founder of Black Pride in uh, New York and Kevin Omni who crossed over from the ball community as a uh, you know house of omni uh, and also uh, in the club scene introducing celebrities and uh, he was a promoter as well so after I met Kevin Omni, I also met uh, Mike Stone. I don't know if you guys know Mike Stone. He is the youngest, uh, rest in peace, uh, he was the youngest uh, gay black promoter in New York City when he mm -hmm. did like the parties in, uh, in like rehearsal spaces and, and couldn't even get clubs to have his parties. Wow. And then after I'm... I was introduced to Mike Stone, and I saw his struggle because he was black and couldn't get into the New York City clubs. And I was white, and I had access to all the clubs. And uh, so I introduced him to club owners and uh, helped him to find spaces to have his parties, and then we did uh, parties together, and uh, we became friends. And then... This was my introduction to the, you know, the black gay community and then making friends with Kevin Omni and then he, re, he, he introduced me then to the ball community. And mm -hmm. Kevin being the historian and me being the activist and historian coming from the rock and roll background and an imperial chord and out music and other gay, artistic, and social uh, uh, communities. I was very interested in the in the history and 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 the trend setting 
aspect of a community, you know, what makes a community trendsetting. That, to me, was mm-hmm. really fascinating. Mm-hmm. So while the guys were getting ready for the runway uh, in the bathrooms, putting their makeup and stuff, I was talking to guys about history and culture and, you know, that sort of thing because I wasn't really into the walking the, the runway thing and get that kind of attention because... I really didn't want that type of attention. I'm more the behind the scenes <laughs> kind of guy, okay. the observing everything, you know. So I was always looking for the cultural and historical artistic aspect of communities and then, mm-hmm. of course, empowering. You know, how can we empower us as a community? And so that was kind of my, my, you know, that's where my head was. And then... Right. Um, you know, the Kevin Omnis and the David Altamars and, you know, once I was introduced to all these people who 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 made the history, they lived it, you know, some are still living it at the time, uh, living it now, and, and uh, so I was always interested in talking about history and stuff, so... My, the, of course, then naturally people start talking to me about Paris is burning. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. what, what about it? It's like, oh, you know, then the Marcel Christians is like, I can't believe it. You know, we got sold out and people got ripped off. And then my personal conversations with Paris Dupree, when I asked him, do you want to be in How Do I Look? And he said, no, Wolfgang, please don't take it personally. I got ripped off by Jenny Livingston. I don't want to do any interviews. I don't want any film appearances. You know, I'm I'm so pissed off with this about this whole thing. And I said, wow. wow, this is really amazing. It's like if you know, if you listen to the public, you know, they all say, I love that film. It's like, wait a minute, there seems to be a whole other side to it and especially people who are in the film, you know. It's right. like uh, the Marcel Christians, you know, he was like, uh, you know, completely uh, uh, disappointed that uh, the, the promotional, promotional materials and, and the, the controversy and, you know, so so basically a lot of, of, all the historians rejected Paris is Burning. So I guess, make a long story short, really? histor- Historians, anybody to do with education, they rejected the film because if you really look at the message besides the cute voguing, the cute elements of it, at the end of the day, if you want to point a finger at a community, Paris is Burning is a a perfect product for the... uh, for the uh, for the um, c- corporations to put their finger and say, see, this is nothing but a bunch of faggots uh, robbing, stealing, and prostituting, because this is what the end of the day the film left behind at for those kind of people looking for those elements so they can marginalize a community and keep them, you know, keep them down. So. Fifteen years wow. ago, oh, I was being told all this stuff, and I was like, "Okay, then why don't you do something about it?" You know, if it was for me, you know, I would have done, <laughs> I would have kicked and screamed. But uh, you know, I learned much later in life, you know, the understanding of when you are a marginalized and disenfranchised community, which uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, black and Hispanic minority communities are. They just don't know how to stand up and fight for justice. Once you are marginalized and disenfranchised and the black community is stripped from their culture, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. they have no access to resources to, uh, you know, how to really organize and how to really go about, uh, you know, starting a movement. I mean, at the, you know, let's face it, it's an artistic community and not some kind of activism or, you know, community that stands up and fights for justice. They are trendsetters in in art. So I was, uh, 15 years ago, I was told about this. And um, Let me go here for just a second because it's interesting that this film was rejected. As you just said, this has become such an iconic 
movie or film uh, presentation with an LGBT culture. And now that you say that, I, I know when I was watching it, that was one of the things that was a bother to me because uh, I don't know the dark-skinned child's name who was who uh, did the military stuff. He was talking about the turkey bowl of fellas and, you know, how certain categories among the ball scene were basic categories. It didn't call for the flamboyancy for those who didn't who didn't identify with the flamboyant side of the community. But – it was always about the girls. It was the working girls. You know, the, the ball started mm-hmm. late because everybody had to go make their money or whatever. Like the work, yeah. And then once yeah, and it, ga- work, and it they gave. They got the balls. Right. And it gave that particular feel that everybody was working the street corners or they just left the club. They went to go work a corner or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, they went to go bash bash a store, you know, or whatever. They went to, you know, mopping and, and clipping and, and, and gooping and carrying on. And then, you know, they would start at 4 o'clock in the morning because everybody was, you know, that that was an appropriate time because everybody was available. And it's interesting that one of the one of the highlights of the movie was Venus, Venus Extravagant, and then she got killed because she was, she was hooking. You know, yeah, and, she, wow. and the family found out through Paris' burnings that she passed <gasps> away. Are you serious? Yeah. I mean, there's so many, so many stories because really? of, you know, I heard, yeah, I heard all kinds of stories, that too, yeah. Her family found out through the film that uh, their do- uh, son, daughter, passed away, yeah. Good evening. No. Yeah. Okay. And of course, no. I mean, yeah, let's face it, if you, if I was part of that community and I was in Paris' burning, would I show that film to my parents? Probably not, because I wouldn't want to uh, show them that element within that commun in within that film. Completely understandable, and Octavia uh, says this perfectly. You know, uh, uh, the, the the community they they look at Paris is Burning as gay entertainment. That's right. all that is. The, exactly. If that, That's if all If the community it is. is is uh uh being portrayed as these prostitutes and drug users and yeah, voguing and trans, all that was was very exciting. But uh, you know, I wouldn't want my family to see this. And and but you know, wow. on, the, on the flip co- on the flip side, these elements are on Wall Street also, on a much more damaging scale than the exactly. whole community will ever have. Exactly. But. Exactly. Uh, you know, when, when Marcel Christian, in, in his interview, he's a ballroom historian, if people don't know, uh, he also rest in peace. He mentioned, uh, he made it very clear when Jenny Livingston, the director of Paris is Burning, came to him, she wanted to know who the thieves were. So he, her intentions was uh, uh, already no good in that sense because... Yes, elements like this are in, in any community, but if you make a documentary, then you have to have a balance. Now we exactly. get to the point to how do I look? When uh, you know, when the community then asks, uh, okay, we need to make another documentary, and then I ask, okay, what did you, what do, what the community wants? How do I look to be? They've, they've mm-hmm. said it has to be educational and it has to be a balance to Paris is burning. So when you say it's a content, uh, it's it's a, a, a sequel a to sequel. Paris is burning. Mm-hmm. It's a sequel in for Paris is burning in content for the for the society, but for the for the ballroom community, it's really a balance. To Paris is burning. Dig it! Wow! And uh, so just to it's... go to to explain to the public here on your show, which has really not been discussed much, the reason, uh, the way, how do I look was 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 created was we had meetings at a, on a regular basis at the center. We had uh-huh. Junior LaBeja, Octavia St. Laurent, Marcel Christian, Kevin Omni, R. R. Chanel, all these people, David Ultima, all these people came to these meetings and gave me their feedback. They gave mm-hmm. me ideas. They gave me all kinds of, you know, what they wanted, how do I look to be. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this was kind of how it got started because the community wanted to have a balance to Paris's burning, and I guess I happened to be there and happened to have this interest in history and culture, gay culture. So they, you know, they agreed to give me the green light because after Paris is burning, there was no video cameras allowed, no still cameras was allowed at balls. And all that kind of, you know, were consequences of Paris's burning. I don't know if the public knows wow. about that, too. No, not at all. There was no cameras allowed and no uh, video, stills or video. And, and Jenny Livingston was never invited back to a ball. Except, really? of course, GMHC. They violated a 20-year-old uh, 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 ball, ballroom policy, but that's another story. So, um, because of my, you know, my interest and background, they were open to let me come in and do videotaping again and do uh, uh, the the How Do I Look documentary and Mm -hmm, have screenings mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Nobody signed a contract. I don't know if you know about the industry, Usually, you sign a contract first, and then you do the taping and, and then, filming, right. and then you you know you have nothing to say basically after that. Right. So because of Paris is burning, and I I felt like okay, the community it's a community, it's an artistic empowerment and HIV AIDS community project. That was kind of the presentation, what the film was going to be. Mm-hmm. So to make mm-hmm. it that, I felt, you know. We'll do the filming, we do the interviews, we do the thing, blah, blah, and then at the end, we show the film. If you don't want to be in it, you tell me and I cut you out. No problem. Right, okay. I don't want to hear any complaints. I don't want to hear any of this, that, or the other. I was always available for suggestions and ideas. And that's mm-hmm. kind of how the film was built on. It was... Uh, Luna Khan became an assistant director. Uh, Kevin Armney became an assistant director. So I always had these lines of communications open to me, and people could go through them to get to me if they didn't know how to reach me. So there was always this open line to the community to give feedback and input on how do I look. Mm, okay, okay. So, and wow. and also the idea as far as you know, everybody wants to know how the money, money, money. The, the, you know, Paris is burning. She had a, a, a five hundred thousand dollar grant money to make the film. I put out about twenty thousand dollar of my money to uh, to get it done. So there oh, was wow. no grant. We didn't get any grant money from any, you know, uh, New York State Council for the wow. Arts and all of that. So we got no support, and we feel like, you know, Paris is Burning uh, contributed to that, you know, that this community, oh, why we would why would we want to give a grant to this type of community, you know? Mm. So, um, but, uh, you know, I was then so dedicated that, you know, that, that motivates me more. <laughs> Once I get rejected, I just work harder and fight harder, you know? That's what actors right. do. So how long how long was this for uh, this process for you from start to finish because it's original years. release 15 years Yeah because uh you know as if you're a historian wow. and you kind you know the thing is I needed to learn who is who especially in the ballroom community everybody proclaims himself an icon you know and they haven't even won a trophy so it's very important <laughs> to kind of, and the misrepresentation in the community is really high. So it was very important for me to study individuals who is who, who, who uh, you know, uh, associates with whom. And so it's very difficult. And, and since it's such a rich culture and so diverse, Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 to get bits and pieces of information takes really a very long time. And, okay. Uh, and some some people from the community they didn't want to be in a film for you know personal reasons. 
uh, and that's something I uh, learned I had to respect, you know, like mm-hmm. in Paris Dupree, mm-hmm. that was something I had to, to respect. Other people, because of their backgrounds, can't be in the film. I had to respect that, too. So I have to make sure that these people were not exposed in purpose or in the background. So just making sure that everything is cool and everybody is protected. Now, exactly. To the, okay. to the, so and now in regards of the contracts, everybody had to sign a release form then a after release, the right. film was finished. And the the model I created, if the film makes money, for example, should the film... I mean, we made very little money. The whole film in all the releases made maybe $50,000, uh, and that's really considered, you know... <laughs> right. It paid some of the expenses and the maintaining of it is seven years. So it's, it's not uh, uh, a lot of money, and if I can, I sponsor a ball or something like that. And... Um, but the idea is, if the, for example, if uh, the contract was built on point on a point system, should the film make a million dollars, then five hundred thousand dollars goes to the administration and continue the promotion, and the other uh, five hundred thousand dollars is then divided to the people in the film. And uh-huh. the point system works like this: if you're just like a split second here and there, you get one point, like. Uh, for example, if you see uh, like uh, um, Extrava, what's her name? Giselle Extravaganza, who does uh-huh. the whole runway thing, that would be like three points. Okay. And people who were like really who had a whole interview, they would get five points. And then mm-hmm. the assistant directors would get seven points. So it was broken down in point system. And, for example, if the film had made a million dollars, then each point would become like $3,300. Okay. And that system is still in place because, you know, we never know. The film may become still successful uh, commercially, financially, and then this is how the money is being divided. Exactly. So it wasn't like uh, people signed a contract and uh, thank you and good night. You know, there was a whole uh, idea behind it to uh, create contracts, and that is a model. Those contracts I created at the time are now a model in in the in my new documentaries I make. I use that as a model. So eventually, should these films make money, it'll help to empower a community financially. But you have okay. to have a, a, mm-hmm. a, an infrastructure created to to allow that to happen. So I created that infrastructure. Now, if if it becomes financially successful, because we basically get rejected, and um, I think a lot of rejection comes from the AIDS agencies, because in really? how I looked at a segment about uh, how people uh, complain about GMHC, and so. Even so, in the beginning, before the film was released, I was uh, lecturing at GMHC using the film, educating the uh, volunteers and people working there. And then I guess once they saw that there was an element in the film that uh, members from the houseboat community were complaining about GMHC, then they completely uh, they, they singled me out and my crew at one of the tapings at Latex Ball harassed us. And then they, um, you know, then they completely ignored uh, uh, how do I look and and the film and and they glamorized the journey. Interesting, you know. Interesting. So, so um, very interesting. So the the how do I look is really a film by the ballroom community for the ballroom community. That's really what okay. it is. And wow. I was basically happened to be there. If it wasn't for my uh, experience in a uh, community, you know, the knowledge about community sensitivities, my artistic background from working in clubs and with artists for at that point 15 years, now it's 30 years, you know, all my experience was needed to actually make that film happen. Because, exactly. Uh, because um, there was a lot of shade flying around and people tell me why you have this queen in it you know she's this that and the other 
It's like if I were to judge anybody, then there wouldn't be a film because you can get dish on on anybody, and then if I was to cut people based on dish, then there would be no film all, uh, at all. So exactly, I, exactly. I had to stand up sometimes and speak okay. up for people because uh, you know I don't judge anybody. We all have a hard time, you know, we are all hit by HIV. All my friends in Germany passed away from HIV, and two of my lovers in New York passed away from HIV. So I'm I'm also affected deeply by by this academic and uh, you know, so if somebody wants to wants me to judge somebody because of this that or the other, I just kind of had to reject it. And I could not uh, be j- walking around judging people and cut them out of the film. Exactly. Let's take a break right here. Uh, let me pay a couple more bills. Yeah, I need to and then, sip on my t- on my tea. Right. Okay. Bit. You sip. I'll be. We'll be right back. And when we come back, let me go into this area of understanding the ballroom scene because, you know, for those of us in the community who are not. You know, the ballroom scene is known for all the femme girls, the loud girls, the flashy girls, the flamboyancy. But, you know, there's elements of our community to where they're very masculine. You know, they want to protect their masculinity and may not understand what all this means, why the flamboyancy or whatever, and why the ball circuit exists. So when we come back, let's go into that and um, uh, let's explain that a little bit more, okay? So we'll be right back after these few messages. Very good. The Internet Sensation is now in print. Get your copy of the book that will not only change your life, but change your thinking as well. Awakenings, Epiphanies Along a Spiritual Journey is a compelling collection of blogs that have been the pinnacle of spiritual development and discernment for its author, Internet talk show host, Big Meech. Not only does this body of work offer the insight from his life experiences, it provides the reader an amazing opportunity to go on a journey that will awaken insight into their own higher power while encouraging personal growth and spiritual development. With chapters such as, I cannot give you life, nor can I live it for you. Truth is a bad bitch. It's time for a career change. I am not your God. And in what love do you operate? You will be captivated and compelled to take the life lessons the book has to offer and apply them to your life. To get your copy today of Awakenings, Epiphanies Along a Spiritual Journey. Go to www.dishingtea.com or you can find it on the web at www.amazon.com or if you prefer an ebook, find it at www.smashwords.com. Awakenings Epiphanies Along a Spiritual Journey. Are you ready? Are you ready for the journey? The Caribbean American Boys Entertainment. We specialize in jerk and conch food catering, party promotions and emceeing, entertainment with the Caribbean swagger, island fever on the mainland, bam bam. (laughs) We also provide customized tour guides through gay-friendly Bahamas to all the hot spots of dining and club life events. Mr. Savano T. DeMarco is the founder and CEO of the CABC. For more information, please contact him at CaribbeanBoysATL at Yahoo.com. That's CaribbeanBoys with a Z, ATL, at Yahoo.com or on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Savano T. DeMarco. That's Facebook.com forward slash Savano T. D M A R. CO, Caribbean American Boys Entertainment, Island Fever on the mainland. Bam, bam.
performance is the art of improvising dance and drama-oriented modeling presentations. It is the interchanging of poses, struts, and ethnic dance gestures. When intricately woven, color graphic movements and poses at times closely resemble symbolic icons found in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Based on African American ethnic origin, it's a logical progression of ancient African movement refined and rehearsed into a modern expression. Widely recognized by its face framing, limb thrusting, muscle popping, floor dipping, spinning, rhythm stepping, and pose striking, performance is a technical dance with an extensive vocabulary. The intense geometrical isolation patterns project its photogenic profile of three-dimensional angular design. Its visual dynamics consist of complex rhythms along with an unpredictable flow of direction. From Africa to the United States, its cultural and regional stages of advancement developed throughout the northern migrations of African Americans to the Harlem Renaissance to the present. Its current identity manifested in the late 60s when African American folk dances along with theater, concert, and runway gestures were combined into one ethnic expression called presentation. Expressions of famous entertainers such as Alvin Ailey, Diana Ross, and Beverly Johnson inspired those who imitated them at showcase venues and New York correctional facilities. During the mid-70s, the dance became a category at balls, marking the beginning of the conventional era. The term presentation was then replaced by performance, originally a feminine dance category with Arabic dancing, flamboyant struts, and fashion magazine poses. But the need for masculine performers wasn't met until the late 70s. By the late 80s, categories like performance with gymnastics, also performance with stretch or new way, began the Olympics type era. As international speculation increased, the classical styles are obscured by a lack of documentation and uncultured newcomers. The disappearances of legendary greats like Stevie St. Laurent, Andre Christian, and Rodney Ebony are unheard of these days, while non-traditional movements are embraced. But as long as African Americans are descendants of Ethiopian Kushites, performance will never perish. And we are back. That there is from a clip from How Do I Look? And that there gives you the history of how voguing, as we know it now, came to be. If you're just joining us, honey, we are sitting down here talking with Wolfgang Bush. He is the director of How Do I Look? A documentary about the ballroom circuit of the New York of New York City that some of you believe is the sequel to Paris is Burning, many of us thought that. However, after talking with him, honey, this is taking it to a whole nother level. So but just before the break, I was asking you, Wolf, to uh, let's go into understanding the ballroom circuit. Because, see, see, a lot of folks don't know this. I'm, I am not a ballroom walker or anything like that. I've gone to a ball before, but I, I never stayed for long periods of time. Because, you know, kids get to fighting and carrying on, and it just becomes buffoonery. However, you know, I am a mother of a house. I'm the mother of the House of Divinity uh, out of Detroit, Michigan, and we were a social justice house. You know, basically, I took my kids, and a lot of them were broken and this, that, and the other, and they did not have a belief system or did not know how to how to reach out to their higher power to get to be better and to do better in their lives. So that there is where I took my kids and still do. So, you know, we were not into the whole circuit or whatever, wanting to walk balls and, and want grand prizes and, and this, that, and the other. And then a lot of us were not looking for that kind of status. You know what I mean? So right. explain to folks, you know, the idea of what the ballroom is, what is its misconceptions and things? Because a lot of people only know it for its flamboyancy. We see the young girls on the trains and carrying on with the purple hair. You know, they're being outrageous right. and carrying on. And, you know, they seem to want that kind of attention. And the more masculine side of our community, you know, they shy, they, they shy away from it. They don't want any parts of it. They don't want to be identified with it because it's too much. So explain that and, and dispel some of the myths. Uh, that is a difficult question for me to ask. I, 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 the newer generation is so influenced by these AIDS agencies because they mm. have created their own subculture. Oh, did that? And that's another issue the the tradition and house ball members have because 
they've they've really lost control over many of the younger generation because they are all becoming eight small children from these agencies because they provide them with a space they they go there and kiki and and do their voguing thing they're not they're not learning anything or they're not taught anything so they basically uh, going to these AIDS agencies because they provide them with a safe space and they can basically do what they want. So there's really no educational uh, control in that environment. Even so, you know, they teach them about prevention, which is fine. But uh, on from the artistic, uh, natural artistic progression, perspective, these AIDS agencies have really manipulated the house ball community as we know it and turned wow. it into these kicky functions where these young kids basically do what they want and um, the community really feels that is not the function of a health agency to get involved in this artistic side of the community. You see, really? so and and also by giving these balls, they've cut into you know. I mean, we're talking. We have a 22-year history with GMHC. Uh-huh. In the beginning, the community came out. They had 4,000 people. The thing was packed. And now people are realizing. Wait a minute. This is cutting into our economy. How can I, as a ball producer, compete with these AIDS agencies who get free government money? How can I, as a ball producer, compete with that? You can't. You can't because the ball producers have to make their money at the door so they can pay for the rental, the trophies, the DJ, the security, and whatever else. So basically, these AIDS agencies who have been giving for years and years and years, and it's not only GMHC, it's GMAT, it's Harlem United, it's it's uh, you know all of the above. They all started giving free balls. So free that ball. really cut uh, the the ball community has lost millions of dollars in their economy because of the manipulation of these AIDS agencies. Really? And this is now starting, you know, be, you know, I mean, I started boiling over last year because, you know, when GMHC invited Jenny Livingston back to speak on behalf of Paris Dupree, which I mentioned earlier, who felt No, she, she did off. not. They right. invited that the, the disrespect, the 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 uh, uh, it's compl- so outrageous that GMHC completely disrespects the ballroom community, inviting Jenny Livingston to speak at their ball in 2011. Let her speak on behalf of Paris Dupree, who personally told me felt ripped off by her and did not want to be in How Do I Look because of her, they let her speak on his behalf because he passed away earlier that year. I want to quote Kevin Omni here. He said, if Paris Dupree knew she was talking on his behalf, he would turn in his grave. Now, I want people to think about that. Now, when people... Uh, when I start this controversy about GMHC, they say, oh, but they do so many good things. And yes, I, I agree, and they do do good uh, HIV prevention education. But why do they have to give free balls? Why do they have to have voguing classes? Why do they have to have kiki functions? Those are artistic programs. has nothing to do with health. But they are so mixed up with these artistic programs because they benefit. They use these children in their advertisement campaigns. They love to be around these children because they are entertaining and they are fun to be around with. So they have a whole confused picture of what what their involvement in the houseball community has become over the past 22 years because their balls are like 95% entertainment 
and maybe uh, you know five percent they talk about prevention or or something else. So if you wow. want to te- if you want to tell me we need those balls for education and outreach, then speak ninety five percent about prevention and outreach and make it five percent entertainment. Not only that. Now they started charging. Now listen to this. They start they start charging the community, and uh, they raised. Well, first of all, they raised twenty eight thousand uh, dollars. The balls went from like four thousand people. They are down to maybe a thousand eleven hundred people. Oh wow! Because the community stopped supporting them. So now the only people that show up are like the 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 kids. The, you know, mm-hmm. the ones they have been able to manipulate and corrupt, they come. And the people that are on, on their payroll, mm. you know, on, on the GMHC payroll, Exponents or Harlem United, GMAT, you know, all the people that work now for this AIDS agency, they are there to support and their girlfriends. But everybody <laughs> else pretty much stopped supporting them. So now from 4,000 to 1,100, that speaks... Uh, uh, it tells a story. Mm-hmm. So now they're raising $28,000 on that ball and nobody knows where that money is going. So oh, when wow. we had a meeting with GMHC and we asked them, you know, where is that money going? They told us, oh, it goes towards other programs. <laughs> so they're telling us they're using the ball community, which is disenfranchised, is under-resourced, is uh, marginalized, they need that community to raise money for other programs. Mm -hmm. The nerve that they can take that money and give it back to the community that needs it most because they're using their uh, 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 talents to raise the money in the first place, they use them you raise that money and give it to to somewhere else. Wow! But this, now explain this is, the ball community because with the disconnect between the HIV organizations and stuff and manipulating the ball community, explain the importance of that community because from Paris's burning, we all understand, you know, the whole idea of the houses. You know, folks have been right. Ostracized by their families or whatever, you know, yeah, the they're, they're understanding their sexual identity. Yeah, exactly, you know, they're understanding their sexual their sexual identity, and this, that, and the other. And so, I know as a mother myself, you know, when I see new babies and carrying on, you know, my job is to make sure that they grow up healthy about what it is that they are to keep them from being so reckless and this, that, and the other, understanding condom usage and understanding how to be respectful citizens and understanding the importance of work. No, you ain't going to lay your ass up in here all day and think that just because we keep keying that everything is cute. You know, so we understand that particular dynamic. But when we get to the ball, you know, everybody want to walk categories and the importance of status and why is that so important to uh, our culture? What have you, what it was it that you learned? It has become so important because the society in this country has become so materialistic. Oh, now there we go. Okay, so okay, okay. Back in the days, they were competing for trophies. There was no mm-hmm. cash. Right. So, you know, the corruption of the money has now a lot to do with it. Mm. You know, like everything else. Once money gets involved, no matter what it is, where it is, once money gets involved, uh, uh, the dynamic of a community or the dynamic of whatever it is will change. So Mm -hmm. once they started with the money prices, that's when the dynamic changed and that's when it became more fierce, more disrespectful, more this and the other, because it really went away from the original idea where it was supposed to be fun and it was supposed to be based on your artistic expression and not, I have to win that trophy. I have to get that cash. You know, wow. It, it, was, it was back then also, I mean, from what I hear, uh, Dorian and Avis, they would compete because they they needed to pay their rent. <laughs> right, okay. So, <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it was part of it, but I guess it wasn't as vicious as and and as you know disrespectful. Well, you know, or, I mean, but we can't generalize it because there's balls where everything is cute and you know nice, but the general, um, you know, I don't want to really generalize too much. Yeah, I I feel you on that because as I'm looking, and you know. You know, I've competed in drag competitions and stuff. Not many, because I don't like I don't like the pageantry of it all. You know, mm-hmm. but I I have gone into, you know, into it with the idea of I'm not necessarily looking to get this crown, honey. I'm to get the exposure, so that I could get more work. See, if you see what I can do, and this, that, and the other, then someone will hire me and book me for this show and book me for that show, and right. that would keep me in the rotation. Versus me having this damn crown, you know what I'm saying? Because hell, the, the, my my very first competition, it was shade in the game. I ended up getting first runner up, but you couldn't tell that the night of because they added the scores wrong. And then the winner of the contest, she became missing in action. So then they wanted me to take over, you know, because you know if the winner cannot do it, then the first runner up would step right. in. Then so when I wanted to step in, then it was like I was the troublemaker and this that. Now I said, well, she didn't do this. This was part of the obligation. She wasn't here for that. She wasn't here for that. So I said I would step in because we couldn't find her bitch ass. And then it just became a whole big old to-do. That was my very, very first pageant back in 1993 was an amateur pageant. And ever since then, I said, fuck this. I'm not doing this shit no more, you know, because yeah. I did not like like the pageantry of it. And then, you know, just the shade and, and this, that, and the third. So that there is just on the drag circuit. So now we're talking ball, and on YouTube there's several fights. There was a one big huge one. These bitches throwing tables and chairs at one another. Yeah, they just North destroyed Carolina. this place. You know, all over. Yeah, all but if, over you know, if I look at that, it's so sad because it's their own people doing it. It's like exactly. the guy was in the room. Why would they let him put that on YouTube? Why would they, uh, you know, not ask him to not do that? But it's like, but that's here. Here we go again. It's um once you really need to understand the word what marginalized community means. Marginalized mm-hmm. community is is a community. They are self destructive and they can't help. They can't organize them. They can't stand up to fight for justice. So if you're looking for an explanation, that is your explanation. These children never wow. had equal opportunity. These children never had anything near what a um, a middle class uh, 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 person has in this community. They were stripped. You guys were stripped from your culture. How can you expect them to uh, to help themselves when they, uh, you know, have been stripped from from their culture and everything, uh, you know, for hundreds of years? So people always ask, you know, why are they doing this? Why is that? Well, that's your explanation. It's a marginalized community. And now that I'm fighting GMHC, I'm going to the media, the politicians, individuals in our community, not-for-profit organizations. Let me tell you something. The Department of Health, I spoke to somebody at the Gay Expo in at Javits Center in New York City complaining yeah. about the, the abuse by GMHC and the marginalization of, of their program. And they and I ask you know and I ask her if I can get her card. She said no. I asked her you know tell, told her more about it. Can I get your card? She said no. The third time I asked her, she moved the cards away so I wouldn't get her business card. And I thought that is kind of strange. So I ask her, are you aware of this abuse by GMHC? Is this the first time you hear about it? She told me she's aware of it. So the thing is, the community, the people in charge who fund this organization are aware of the abuse by GMHC, and they all turn a blind eye because they're all being paid off by them, they're all corrupted oh. by them, and nobody gives a damn about the ballroom community because they're nothing but a bunch of these prostitutes and drug users. Thank you, Paris is burning. <laughs> Now, you know, here's an interesting question, because how you just explained that, as a person, as as being Caucasian, as being someone who um, you were not born in this country, and to come into all of this, 
and now you've been inoculated with with African American culture here in in the United States, and to see all of this, what other cultural differences do you see within gay community that speaks to the movie How Do I Look for you to be the historian to say, listen, this needs attention. Somebody needs to understand what this is about. The the art in general. I dealt with the black community uh, uh, in Germany when I was touring with the band as a sound and light engineer. The mm-hmm. musicians were all uh, all Germans and they had a, a black uh, female singer. So because I was speaking English, I became the negotiator and uh, the communicator between the singer and the band, and that goes back 30 years now. (laughs) So I was already then part of this whole, you know, being involved in in this negotiation of representing black people to the white community. Mm -hmm, And then mm -hmm. not only that, in Germany, when if you know about the the military in Germany, we had um, we had uh, discos in Germany, all all blacks. I was the only white boy in Germany in a club that was all black. There was one white boy, there was me, and three girlfriends I went to school with who liked black men. Mm -hmm. And I was then learning the bump, the hustle, and the line dance. So oh, okay. I was exposed to the black culture in Germany in the 70s. Okay. And somehow, looking back now, that has stuck with me all these years, all my life. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. To, the, to the what else I see is in Germany, if you're an artist, you are treated with respect. When we traveled as a band, we were respected like we were rock stars, even so we were just a, you know, a, a top 40 band doing cover music. But we oh, wow. were treated with respect. I mm-hmm. come to this country and we were touring in the South and it's like, wait a minute, these people treat us like a piece of crap. And then we had a black bass player, Frank. Then I find out we can't play in that club because we have a black bass player. And I mm. said, what? This is how I got, like, really became aware of this whole racism and, and, and discrimination type thing. So I was already aware the, about the artists in this country, how disrespectful they were treated. And and then I was a club promoter. I was a booking agent at Limelight, Palladium, Danzateria. So I've been dealing with artists in this country for a very long time. I had like a thousand artists on my booking list. Mm-hmm. So I was very well aware and working at the Musicians Union in New York, the largest musicians union in the country. So I was well educated about not for profits, uh, bylaws, committees, and board of directors, and um, uh, the issues how how the racism and the power struggle and the you know the cliques and the how to get the majority of the board, the votes, and all this. I go back like 25 years. Wow. So uh, other elements that I see is the disrespect that artists experience in this country and that I experienced while I was working for the biggest clubs in the city. I had access to all the record companies because I also had a public access show Every label, Sony, you name them, they all wanted to push their music videos to play on a public access show. So I had access to them, and I was, and I met the biggest uh, people in the in the record industry. Mm. And uh, and that's where I learned the the women were bitches, the blacks were niggers, and the gays were the faggots. And I said, what the hell is going on in this in this environment? I don't want to have anything to do with it. Wow. I had, I could be I could be a president of some some major label or whatever and I kissed it all goodbye and said no. I I cannot be associated with this. I'm going to have to go and find something within the gay community that I can build that I respect and is respected because I cannot work in an environment that is that is so corrupted and discriminative. 
So I kissed all this corporate stuff goodbye and I looked around in the gay community. I said, we are the creative children. There got to be some project I can create or some product I can create with the community that makes uh, a difference in in the artistic life of people in the in the in the in this country and specifically for the gay community. So mm -hmm. I actually created an artistic infrastructure with programs. I can tomorrow I can I can uh, operate a, a artistic community center for gay artists for the ballroom community. I have I have a, a whole diagram. I have already programs. I have 17 programs, uh, art and education programs written. I can start, if I get funding, I can start this tomorrow. <clears throat> wow. So, wow. The, uh, the question you're asking, what else I saw is, is the artistic disrespect in this country. Because the, the industry is so exploitative. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. they they love to have the ball children in the artistic ghetto, I call it, because the more they are in the artistic ghetto, the more the the, the industry benefits and robs them from right. ideas. The fashion designers exactly. inspi inspired, the dancers, Madonna, let me tell you something about her. Oh. Because she recently used the ninjas, Benny and Javier Ninja, on yeah. the tour uh, in, in Jersey for the Super Bowl. Oh, oh yeah. I, and I spoke to Javier. It's like it would be really nice if we could get a letter from Madonna or some kind of statement, video, written, whatever, acknowledging what voguing kind of meant for her, put it in some kind of historical perspective so we as a community have something we can look at. And can right, say, right. see, Madonna gave that to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. This wow. queen is, is only in it for herself, and there's nothing in it for her to actually do something unconditionally. I'm saying that unconditionally for a reason, right. because if it has some kind of attachment where they benefit, then it's not making a contribution to the community. To the then community. It's it's to the, right, yeah. exactly. Ah, yes, so right, Ms. right. So, Madonna, you know, forget her. Same thing, uh, Lady Gaga. I met her publicist before she became famous. Publicist, I, you know, I heard she, you know, he told me her fashion house is House of Gaga. In the early stages, she, she used... Uh, 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 sound bites from Paris is Burning, so she was really inspired by by the houseboat community. Mm -hmm. So it was suggested to contact her. Maybe she wants to do a narration on how do I look. We do re-editing. We reached out to her. We understand you were very inspired by the ballroom community. Would you consider to do blah blah blah? Nothing, because there's nothing for in, in there's nothing in it for her because it's not presented to her where she can make millions of dollars or make make the the CBS NBC news or you know MTV news <laughs> ah! because now she was asked to actually give something back to the community unconditionally and they completely reject that just so it gives you an idea so wow now that okay Mm. So now, basically, what we're doing now is we ask the, the public to boycott the, uh, the, the the latex ball because uh, we met with GMHC. We brought to their attention the marginalization, the cutting into the economy, and now they completely uh, cut off communication. They're rejecting uh, historians and the activists from the community. And they continue to, they decided to marginalize the community further. So mm. because of their silence, we decided to campaign, protest against GMHC. And uh, we asked the public to boycott the latex ball, 2013. And uh, we've released videos, uh, we've gotten the attention. And let me tell you something. We can't even get legal the Legal Aid Society 
who's representing the poor people who need legal mm-hmm, help. Mm-hmm. We we can't even get their support. Nobody wants to touch it. Nobody you know, really? even if you break it down, blah blah blah, they all understand it and oh my god and one lawyer's response was uh Mr Bush, we you know appreciate your support for the community. Unfortunately I volunteer my time and I make financial contributions to GMHC. I don't wanna have the you know, I I don't wanna be involved in that. Now this is a lawyer who now understands there is abuse by the GMHC agency, but instead of helping the community, which he probably made a, 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 you know, he had to make an aid when he was sworn into office to help the community, he'd rather uh, support GMHC and 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 supports their abuse than saying, okay, I donated my time and money, but I didn't know about this, and well, let me talk to them or see if I can do something for the community. He says no. Mm. He rather wow. supports the abuse than help the community to to uh, from from that abuse. So wow. now uh, we have this whole campaign about boycotting the latest. Oh, hello? Oh, Lord, his car dropped. I think he sat up there and uh, talked out his battery or something. Maybe he went to a dead zone. He'll call back in just a few moments. It, wow, I am floored by this particular information. And, uh, ha! Mm, mm, mm. My next good set of questions, honey, is going to come in in just a few moments because I want to, to get into, you know, we have lost a lot of the cast members from Paris is Burning and some of the cast members from How Do I Look, Willie Ninja, uh, has passed on. You know, Pepper Labeja has passed. Uh, Octavia St. Laurent recently passed last couple of years. Uh, you just heard Paris Dupree is, has passed on. Uh, Dorian Corey has passed. Um so yeah, that's gonna be that's where I want to go with these next set of questions. However, I'm waiting on Mr. Bush to call back in, honey. But y'all know I'm a conspiracy theorist, and child, ha! Hold on, I think this might be him. Whoa. Yeah, that's me. Sorry, I don't okay, know why. Okay, yeah, I figured your cell phone probably just just dropped. <laughs> so you're Let's getting go. the idea. I am, but let's go here because I was just explaining it to everyone. You know, I have lost about some... uh, five minutes, ten more minutes, and then I okay, yeah, go. so do I. So, th- so let's make this the last question, yeah, uh, which is perfect actually. We've lost so many of the cast members, so uh, you know the legend, the legendary children, right. you know those who were the mothers of the houses, who who were actually the ones that were the role models. So. You know, in 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 lieu of losing those, how is it that you've been able to to maintain your sanity with the with a lot of the folks that we've lost, particularly those that you've worked with? And how do I look? And then looking over the young kids now, and they have no respect for their house mothers, or at least it seems as though the houses and the ball has changed. What 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 is that for you? And what what would you say needs to happen to to bring all that in? Since these kids are really not listening. Yeah, well, well. first of all, we need to change our infrastructure. We can no longer have AIDS organizations who are health agencies run a community that is artistic, that, who are uh, artistic trendsetters. So mm. that's why, you know, if you really look at it, what fabulousness has come out of the ball community in the last 10 years? I can't really think of anything. No, there hasn't See? been outside of so, fights and, and, and you know. why is there? How come a trendsetting community hasn't really been able to produce something that has been over the edge what they used to be able to do? And my explanation right. is because of the manipulation of these AIDS agencies, they they completely corrupted the the artistic infrastructure and the natural artistic progression because now you have these children go to these AIDS agencies running around disrespectful because all the AIDS agencies care about is sign up the the sign up sheet 
because that's mm-hmm. how they get their grant money, and they basically don't give a damn what the kids do. So wow. when you have that kind of environment that is not controlled somehow in a in an artistic uh, uh, progression way, and is really controlled by you know do what the hell you want, then there is really no stimulation. Uh, to kind of push each other artistically because all you're doing is kiki now. Right, right, right. So I blame a lot of that to the AIDS agencies because uh, I, you know, and the and the mothers and fathers, you know, that was that's always debatable. You know, I know <laughs> they if you interview them, they all say, yeah, all my kids. My children go to school. All they got a job. It's just you know a lot of that is really cover up, and most of it isn't isn't really that much of a truth, to be honest. Mm. But wow. um, but people try. You know, I don't say they're not trying. Of course they try. But again, when you are marginalized, uh, under resourced, and and disenfranchised, you know. You, you, your heart is in the right place, but if you don't have the resources, then it's just, you know, it's really a miracle if if, if, yeah. if somebody comes out of it and is really successful. And a very few, you know, the voguing has been really been helpful over the last three to five years, you know, where the, the ninjas, a lot of them, and the Milans and the Extravas have been traveling around the world and teaching. And now they also figure found the uh, old way voguing, you know, Mohammed and 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 Owl's Army, they're traveling also now uh teaching old way because at first it was the new way the children ac- around the world discovered. And now it's uh, they're also into the old way. So I'm happy to, to see that the white females across the world are interested in learning that. And maybe something positive will come out of that. But unless we change the infrastructure, get the AIDS agencies out of the artistic environment, let them go to the pier, the saunas, and do your prevention there and outreach and education, you don't need voguing classes. You don't need balls. Times have changed. You can reach the kids uh, through Internet. Everybody has a Facebook page. And I saw a video they they did on one of those kiki functions. They have the people that go there inviting their friends to come to the function. So what do you need GMHC for if the if you if the children coming <laughs> to your workshop are inviting the friends to come to to the to the mini ball Friday night? Right, it's right. Like times have really changed, but they are not changing because if it's job for them. You know, it's it's like they don't care if if the ball community loses a million dollars on 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 uh, revenue on balls. They don't care if there is no new idea coming out of the ballroom community. You know, like voguing or you know bizarre fashion or whatever it is they may you know create in the future. They don't care about that. They care about their paycheck. Wow. And this is what it has become, you know. And, uh, you know, my question is, now that the the, the AIDS organizations have created their own ballroom subculture, what what about in 10 years from now? The only children you see running around are AIDS agencies' children. Mm. And how is that going to help the... and, And I say that the ballroom community, as we know it, the existence is at risk. You know what? Yeah, because that made that makes so much sense right there. Because for everybody that's fighting for funding, you know, for treatment, for housing, you know, with our HIV community, if they're taking the money to fund balls and everything as a means of trying to get attention or trying to grab the young folks, then they're they're putting the money in the wrong spot. The money then, wow, and see, it's going, see then it's it becomes going in the so wrong political. Direction. It's yeah. giving jobs to people with health degrees, and it's not giving the jobs with the artistic background. If uh, you know when you read the GMHC mission statement, you know, in creating jobs, developing this, that, and the other. 
So let's look at 22 years of GMHC history with the household community. How many jobs did we get? Mm. I don't see one. <laughs> okay. I don't see one executive job. I don't see one high management job. I don't see one supervising job. Uh, the only job I see is like an assistant to the to the guy with the health diploma because <laughs> he's in charge of the program because it's a health agency and you need a health diploma to run that program. How pathetic is that? They wow. are autistic children. So wow. we can't even develop an infrastructure to help the Baldwin community because the aid agencies really don't allow it, nor are they in support of it because they're cutting off communication with us. So we now boycott the latex ball to shut down the latex pro program. Interesting. Wow. Well, let everybody know where they can get a copy of of the movie. If, I also would love know to about give your a other couple movies. copies away. If, oh. If, if you want to take some names and addresses, if you want to forward to me, I'd be more than happy to give two, three copies away. All right. That yes. there is fine. I'm going to make a contest out of it. So, uh, yeah. Anybody and who's they can interested, go to the website if they want uh -huh. more information. It's how do I look NYC dot org. How do I look NYC dot org. See, when you yeah. go there, you're going to find a lot of things because I, I'm interested in your other uh, documentary with the with the flogging and all of that with the oh, flags is, and this uh, and that. Yeah, that is. If you want to go to that, it's uh, uh, I, the company is Art from the Heart NYC dot org. And then you so have we both. have how do I look nyc dot org and art from the heart nyc dot org. Cool. All right, all right, honey, this has been very educational, and yes, I'm going to make a contest out of this. So yes, I'm going to I'm going to give three away. Three, that's a good number. Father, Son, Holy and Spirit. And if you want to give that. away a flagging with the flogging, I throw in uh, three of those too. All right. Well, okay. So, all right. So, we have six potential uh, gifts on the table right now, yeah. uh, courtesy of Mr. Wolfgang Bush. And uh, yes. So, I, wow. I'm. I'm. <laughs> to, I, I know. Thank you. I okay. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, you know, anytime you need some information or you have a specific question, feel free to contact me. That I shall. So with that, I'm going to let you get back to your day. This has been very educational, and this is, this is part of the piece because I have – see, this has just given me umpteen ideas to follow up with because, see, now I'm on, I'm on, the, I'm on, I'm on this HIV component of this because, yeah, you just hit something that has really got me intrigued. So, yes, we will talk We will talk again soon. I'm going to let you get to your day, darling, and I just want to thank you. Everybody, this is Wolfgang Bush, director of How Do I Look. This is a really in-depth look, a balanced, comprehensive look at the ballroom scene there in New York City. Thanks, Wolf. I, I'm looking, thank I, you, I'll Disney. get with you. All Have right, baby. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Baby, I am so floored right now. I'm gagging. I'm coughing. I'm everything. Can you stand it? Can you stand it, Chirin? I See, I want, I want to talk to Jennifer Livingston. I really want to talk to her because if every, if all of, if I'm, I'm going to say the word alleged because I have no, no, no truth to it. But just dealing with what the facts are, or, 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 or what was presented, I didn't say facts, what was presented. Allegedly, Jennifer has has gone through, and she sold these children under, you know, just just put them under the bus. And if that's the case, I would love to hear her side of this. I would love to sit down and get in. See this whole HIV component, because a lot of the agencies have been losing funding over the years, and this, that, and the other. They have called themselves getting quote unquote creative with getting the kids to come in. So if they have gone through and started having balls and this, that, and the other, then that means the money going in the wrong place. So a lot of you who are positive going to these agencies trying to get funding for your housing, your utilities, and this, that, and the other, and they keep telling you they ain't got no money, now you're starting to understand why. And if they're doing it in New York City 
or if it's alleged that they're doing it in New York City, how many other damn agencies around the country are doing the same exact thing where all these cities are having balls? My hometown, Detroit, throw balls a lot. They have become one. Philadelphia has become one, which incidentally, I think that's where they were with that fight that's on YouTube where they throwing chairs and shit at each other and, and picked up the tables and throwing tables at one another. Ridiculous. You know, those kinds of things. So, it, it, you know, now it's starting to open up something because if this if this is true, then where is all of the comprehensive stuff going on? I, I'm telling you now, ooh, he done just opened, child, baby, didn't I say this was a hot pot of tea? Ooh, all tea, no shade, honey, all tea. Oh, my Lord, honey, I'm telling you, wow, I'm floored. I am absolutely floored. So on that regard, honey, what we're going to do, I'm going to end on the song, okay? Uh, 